All right. Well, I see uh, 103 on the time there. So I know we got a tight schedule, so we'll get started and, uh, you know, keep everybody uh, within their time limits that they're available today. So thank you everyone for joining us, everybody attending, and thank you especially to our guests today. My name is Dan Pru. I'm the general manager for the Greater Vernon Chamber of Commerce, and I'll be the moderator for our town hall this afternoon, a beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Chamber Week, so I'd like to recognize that. And uh, we're again very excited to be able to you know, advocate for our members in the community and bring these opportunities to our members to uh, you know, meet with elected officials and, and ask their questions and maybe have their concerns addressed. So thank you to everybody uh, again for joining and for our guests being here today. Uh, we do have 45 minutes, so this will run until 1.45. And uh, if anybody wants to submit questions, they should be able to do so via the Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll monitor those and ask questions uh, as they come in and as time permits. Uh, so I will get started by just doing a quick uh, introduction for our guests with us today. So in alphabetical order, we've got Mr. Minister uh, Callan. So Ravi Kalan was elected as the MLA for Delta North in 2017 and re-elected in 2020. Ravi is the Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation, and previously served as the Parliamentary Secretary for Sport and Multiculturalism. We also have joined with us today as Minister Popham. Uh, Lana Popham was elected MLA for Saanich South in 2009 and then re-elected in 2013, 2017, and 2020. She is the Minister of Agriculture, Food, and Fisheries. She has also served as the official opposition critic for agriculture, small business, and tourism, arts, and culture. And our very own MLA, Harwinder Sandhu. So Harwinder was elected as MLA for Vernon Monashi in 2020 prior to being elected Harwinder was a registered nurse at Verdon Jubilee Hospital and worked as a patient care coordinator, an active member of the BC Nurses Union. She served as provincial chair of the Mosaic of Color Caucus and as a lobby coordinator. So thank you to the three of you for joining us today. Much appreciated. Uh, so to move things along, I will give you each two minutes for your opening statements. And again, we'll just go in alphabetical order. So Minister Callan, if you'd like to take it away. Yeah, thank you and uh, good afternoon to everyone that's uh, tuning in. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, I want to bring greetings uh, on behalf of Premier John Horgan and, and recognize Mr. Popham, uh, who's on the, on the screen with me, and, uh, and my good friend Harwinder Sandhu, who's just a fantastic advocate for the region, and it's nice to, nice to see her as well. And I want to first uh, start off by acknowledging that I am uh, gathered today from the traditional territory of the um, Lekwungen-speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Uh, and I want to thank you, Dan. Thanks for the in invitation. And uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here for BC Chamber Week. Uh, and uh, I think more than ever, uh, chambers are proving why they're so important for communities uh, during this challenging time, navigating all the resources that are available from different sources uh, and having the chamber be able to be a, a place to bring it all together and, and raise the voices of businesses uh, during this critical time is, is very important. So thank you for, for all your work and thank you for chambers across BC. Um, since becoming minister, I've, I've made it a priority actually to engage with business owners and industry organizations and, and your input is critically important. I, uh, you know, I often say that um, government doesn't have a monopoly on good ideas. Uh, the best programs and policies are created through collaboration. And I, I just wanna let everyone that's tuning in know that you know, we, we're listening. Uh, the province is committed to working with uh, you on their economic recovery plans. So it's important to have industry partners in all levels of government uh, at the table for when we have these important conversations. Um, many of uh, your uh, members will know that BC entered the pandemic as an economic leader in Canada. We had the lowest unemployment, we had really strong job growth. But the second wave of the pandemic has been uh, uh, a bit of a long struggle. You know, people say there's a light at the end of the tunnel and I just say the tunnel's a bit too long <laughs> for my liking, uh, but we're making progress. And since the economic low point uh, last April, BC has seen nine consecutive months of job growth. Uh, but however, we know that challenges remain and some sectors where the pandemic continues to interfere with their operations are still struggling, particularly hospitality, folks in tourism, and people that are in the personal services sectors. 
some uh, businesses in these sectors won't be able to return to full capacity until we work through this crisis. And this, this pandemic, though, has revealed that hardships are not evenly distributed. Uh, we know uh, people of color, Indigenous people, women, young people continue to be more vulnerable to lost hours, lost revenue, to higher unemployment. And, you know, there's a saying that we're all in the same storm, but all of us are in different boats. And uh, that means some of us are weathering the storm a little bit better than others. But that's why it's critical that we continue to build a more inclusive economy that doesn't leave anyone behind. And my ministry, the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation has a really broad mandate. We have a team of very dedicated public servants that are working on programs for small businesses, for the tech sector, manufacturing, shipbuilding, aerospace, uh, aviation, and one of my favorite topics, which is uh, mass timber. Uh, we'll also cover uh, the uh, export development, strategic investment and trade agreements. Uh, the, the common thread that runs through all these files is our approach to economic recovery. And our approach to economic recovery is gonna be guided by three key pillars, innovation, sustainability, and inclusiveness. Innovation, because this pandemic has accelerated the pace of change and innovation is needed to adapt. Things we expected to happen five to seven years from now are happening right now and that pace is not about to slow down. And the way we work, the way we study, the way we shop, the way we're communicating right now are changing rapidly and forcing businesses and governments to innovate to keep up. We are here to support efforts to innovate and pivot to whatever the new normal is. Secondly, sustainability, because we can't ignore climate change. Uh, as all of you know, BC is a world leader when it comes to clean renewable energy but we also are responsible, low carbon producers of natural resources and manufactured goods. We're working to make sustainability a larger part of British Columbia's brand and our global competitive advantage as we move forward. Thirdly is inclusiveness, because, we can't, uh, because we're committed to building an economic recovery that works for everyone. That means improving childcare so that women can return to the workforce, expanding our workforce. This means uh, taking steps to uh, address reconciliation. We, we owe it to the people on whose territory we live and work to make real progress there. This also means helping underrepresented people gain skills and experiences necessary to get good jobs, whether it's in tech, healthcare, or in construction. Uh, and, and lastly, I'll say, you know, it's critical that we have indigenous and black and people of color, um, peoples and communities uh, at our table because we can't make good decisions unless we have everybody having a seat at that table. Um, and I'll just touch on the Stronger BC. Uh, many of your members will know we launched a $1.5 billion economic recovery plan, which was created on the pillars, innovation, sustainability, and inclusiveness. And the plan will fortify BC's healthcare system, expand critical public services. It helps thousands of people reskill for jobs and will put thousands of businesses with resources to help them adapt and grow. Uh, we've just recently unveiled a new program under Stronger BC called Launch Online. That program provides grants to help businesses build their online sales so they have the opportunity to become more competitive and, and to be able to grow their markets. Uh, Stronger BC also includes a small and medium-sized business recovery grant, which I'm sure we'll be talking about today. This grant helps businesses recover while avoiding taking on more debt. Uh, it also includes additional funds for uh, those are, that are in the tourism sector. And then lastly, I'll just say that this COVID-19 has uh, really tested us all. Uh, not all businesses and communities are struggling, but those that are struggling really need our supports. And we're prepared to invest in people, invest in businesses to restore economic growth. While we know there's so much more work that needs to be done, I'm confident that we'll be able to make progress together. I'm really grateful for our partnerships that we have, the ongoing commitment to economic development with chambers across BC. And I want to thank you, Dan, for helping facilitate this conversation today. And I look forward to questions from your members. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Callan. Uh, I will throw it over to you, Minister Popham, for your two minute uh, opening statement. That's great, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. And um, I'm also coming to you from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples down at the legislature. I don't get to cross paths with my colleagues very much. So I may take the opportunity to walk down the hall and have a safely distanced conversation with Minister Callan after this. Um, but it is, it's great to be here. Um, I'm really happy 
to uh, be here with one of our newest MLAs as well. It's very exciting. I think Minister Callon uh, really uh, opened up the conversation for all of us here. And so I'll give you um, from my perspective how my ministry is playing a role currently. Um, it's an interesting ministry to have as we uh, found ourselves facing a pandemic last spring. Um, people started to realize as grocery shelves store, uh, the shelves in the grocery stores were becoming bare that um, they were worried about their food security. And uh, it wasn't so much that goods weren't available, but there was a problem with distribution because people were doing uh, very enthusiastic shopping. Some people like to say hoarding, but it was enthusiastic shopping. And um, they were buying up pasta, flour, eggs. We saw things that we would normally have a, a very easy time sourcing uh, not being there and also limits being put on those products. And so um, we knew that British Columbians were very worried about their food security. Uh, since we became government the first time um, three years ago, there was a real focus that my ministry had on resiliency and food security. And this pandemic really it enabled us to launch some of our programs a lot more quickly because they became very strong priorities. And so um, we see that the ministry is developing a food system around the province so that we can ensure a very strong domestic foundation for our growers our processors, our fishers, um, but also uh, make sure that we continue when possible to encourage our international markets to stay strong. But as we saw during the pandemic, those international markets changed very, very quickly. And uh, it really forced producers to become more nimble. Um, we saw a seafood processor uh, just off of Vancouver Island who had wholly, um, uh, depended on a market in Japan for their processed seafood immediately come to a halt. They changed their business plan. We were able to assist them as government to uh, come up with an e-commerce type program. And so they started doing home deliveries. You could get frozen uh, seafood products delivered to your door. They started working their way up Vancouver Island. Now they're delivering all the way into Delta where Minister Callan lives. Uh, and they have told us that although the international market uh, worked for them previously, they didn't realize the power of the domestic market. So when we get the opportunity to uh, engage in the international market again fully, they're going to keep the part of their business plan as a domestic market too, because we've realized so strongly that consumers believe in what we're producing here. And uh, we wanna make sure that we are enforcing that as much as possible, which you see from our Buy BC program that if you watch the hockey games these days, you'll see Buy BC coming in and, and advertising, but people believe in British Columbians and, and so do we as government and we wanna be the wind at everybody's back. So yeah, so I'm happy to be here and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Popham. And uh, to our MLA, our winter Sadu, your two minutes uh, opening statement. Thank you, Dan. And good afternoon, everyone. I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, that I'm speaking to you from the unceded territory of the Okanagan Indian Nations, and I thank them for their stewardship to this land. Before I begin, I would like to take a moment to pay respect to our amazing community advocate, late Amali Bono. Molly recently passed away. I would like to acknowledge her commitment to community education and her dedication to reconciliation. In Molly, we saw the ability one person holds to affect change for the better. Molly was a true community champion and will be missed. Uh, let's take a moment to uh, pay our respect, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining in today. So now I would like to thank Greater Vernon Chamber of Commerce for organizing this town hall and wish you all happy Chamber Week. I thank my colleagues, the Honorable Minister Lana Popham and Ravi Kalum for taking the time 
from their busy schedule to attend this event. I would like to applaud the chamber and its members for making significant adjustments and sacrifices during these unprecedented times. I highly value the contribution of our businesses in local and provincial economy and for providing many opportunities to people in our community. I had the opportunity to meet many of our business owners last month to discuss how our government can help during these times. I would like to recognize our nonprofit organizations for their work, helping vulnerable members of our community. It is especially nice to see organizations like Turning Points get funding to increase public spaces for addictions and mental health recovery. I'm also excited to be working with our local farmers and food producers along with Minister Popham as she highlighted some of the key areas we're working on so that we can bring the best of what Vernon Monashi has to offer to community, region, province, and the world. Uh, you are all part of, the, of part of what is going to make BC's econ economic recovery successful. And I am excited to be able to work with you, not just on building back better, but on what comes after. So I look forward to hearing from you today. Thank you. Thank you, MLA. Uh, Harwinder Sandhu, appreciate your opening statements. Uh, we'll move uh, right into questions now. We have uh, roughly 25 minutes left to, uh, uh, to our town hall this afternoon. So if I could ask, just uh, limit uh, your answers to two minutes or less. It's sometimes a difficult task, but just so we can get through as many questions as possible from the chamber and, uh, and the attendees, that would be appreciated. So I'll throw our first question over to uh, Minister Callan. And the uh, question is, Concerns have been raised that the eligibility criteria for the small and medium-sized business recovery grant program are restrictive, particularly with businesses having to create a recovery plan. Will the criteria evolve to allow more businesses to apply, and will the program be extended beyond March 31st, 2021? Yeah, thanks for the question. And, uh, and first, I want to acknowledge uh, that uh, I understand how challenging of a time it is. Uh, my family ran a restaurant for close to a decade here in Victoria, and I can't even imagine having to run one during a pandemic and how challenging that is. And so uh, uh, we know it's challenging and that's why we've uh, announced a whole host of programs. I think it's important to put in context, the small business medium recovery grant is one part of the com complete package of things that we've uh, announced. Uh, uh, we've got tax credits for employees being hired or rehired. We've got property tax breaks. We've got um, uh, you know, we've uh, liquor pricing reductions for restaurants uh, that are operating up to 25%, uh, and the list goes on. And now the recovery grant program was designed to be a two-part process, one for a recovery plan to be built, and then also the financial support. I think uh, every business I've spoken to believes they need to have a recovery plan. <laughs> I don't think there's many businesses that don't think they need to do that. And so what we've done is uh, a few weeks after becoming minister in late November, uh, I met with uh, the chambers, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the BC Chamber of Commerce, the tourism operators, uh, the uh, various organizations that rep represent um, folks in the small and medium uh, business sectors uh, and said, what changes can we make to this program to make it more efficient to make it easier and more streamlined. And we did all those in late December, uh, December 21st, in fact. Uh, and those changes have uh, dramatically changed the, uh, the amount of applications we're coming in. We had about close to 1500 applications come in by the end of last year. Uh, this year alone, in the last four weeks, we've seen over 6,000 applications come in. And so the changes have made it really accessible. I think two points that I'll highlight that there was a misunderstanding from a lot of small businesses on. One, many thought it was another loan. And so businesses were saying, hey, we don't need any more loans. We need, some, we need cash injection into our business. And so it's critically important for people to know that this is non-repayable um, and, uh, and they should apply now. Secondly, uh, we heard from some businesses saying, well, you know, uh, building a recovery plan is you know, challenging and I don't have time to do the work and this and that, you know, trying to keep the business going. Uh, and uh, we heard them. And so what we've done just in the last few weeks is change the program so that uh, bookkeepers and accountants of your choosing, whoever you work with, can now do the work for you, submit your application, and we will pay them directly up to $2,000 to do the work. So the small business doesn't have to do the, uh, the, the work. 
your bookkeeper and your accountant can help you do all that. Uh, and we'll pay your bookkeeper and accountant to do that work. And we've seen a, a, a tremendous pickup in the program. Over 60% of the applications that have been coming in are from tourism operators. We're going to continue to monitor this growth in applications in the coming weeks, and then we'll decide. But I think the most important thing here is the money uh, has been dedicated for uh, supporting small and medium-sized businesses. It's going to be used for that. It's not going to be used for some other purpose. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to see how many applications come in, how much dollars are being allocated, and we'll make decisions in the coming weeks on how to shift the program or what, what other options we have available, but we're not there quite yet. Okay, thank you, Minister Kellogg. Uh, the next question is for Minister Popham. So BC has a per capita expenditure of $17 on agriculture versus $40 per capita in Ontario. Why is the level of government support for agriculture and food security in BC so low? And what is your government prepared to do about it? Great, thank you for the question. Um, it's too bad we only have 45 minutes uh, today because uh, if once I start talking about all the things we're doing within the ministry, uh, I can't seem to stop, uh, but I'll try. I'll try and keep it brief. So um, I'm really proud of the budget of my ministry. We have about $95.4 million, and that is almost $14 million larger than under the previous government. So uh, I'm saying that just to, to, to highlight that there has been an increase in my budget. But more importantly, it's how you spend that money. And we're spending it very smartly. We are making sure that we're on the ground with farmers figuring out what they need. I have a mandate called Grow BC, Feed BC, Buy BC. Uh, Grow BC focuses right in on what farmers need on the land base. And what we heard loud and clear over the last few years is that uh, farmers need uh, industry specialists to help them out, to advise them. They need business specialists. Just you're good at growing something doesn't necessarily mean you're a good business person and so my ministry steps in with business supports to try and help people come up with uh, feasibility studies business plans etc and so we have a really big focus on making sure businesses which really agriculture in bc uh, is mostly private business um, how do we help those businesses succeed? Um, we're able to open up different uh, markets within our, our province to support the growing of certain products, processing, and then marketability. Uh, one big policy change that we've done is to encourage our health authorities to buy more grown and processed products in BC. We spend a lot of money as a province um, supplying food into the hospital system, and our farmers are really excited about being able to take part in supplying the health authorities with the products they need. Um, so it's about how we're spending it. We're also reminding people as much as we can that when you make a purchase in British Columbia that's grown by a farmer, processed by a food processor, that you're putting money right into the communities, the communities like Vernon. Thank you, Minister Popham. Our next question is over to uh, MLA Harwinder Sandu. So Greater Vernon residents have endorsed plans for a new cultural center that will create employment, attract visitors to the re region and revitalize downtown while celebrating our culture and heritage. What steps are you taking to ensure a grant application for the project will be approved by your government? Thank you. Great question. Um, I acknowledge that Greater Vernon Advisory Committee of the Regional District of North Okanagan has done incredible work putting this project and application together. I personally support this project even before becoming an MLA, as I have seen the value and need for this project. Therefore, I've mentioned this to Premier John Horgan during my one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with him. And I have also had a meeting with Minister, uh, Minister Osborne to advocate for this project. And then later I had a meeting along with my staff with ministry and uh, ministry staff to follow up and give them some background and uh, to advocate again. There are many competing priorities at the provincial level right now. Economic recovery is on everyone's mind. And this is a project, I believe, strongly believe that I would love to see come to fruition. I understand the grant application is underway. The Investing in Canada program um, is a cornerstone of our economic recovery plan and is currently oversubscribed. But I see the importance of this project to our community and, and I will be supporting it the entire way. The ICIP 
is a merit-based program, which considers the impact of investments based on population. And award decisions are made by impartial public servants. The de decision will be made by the end of this summer from what I gathered during my meetings. And I sincerely hope that this project gets the funding it needs to move forward. Meanwhile, I'm trying to strengthen our application and going to provide my support letter for this project. Ministry also reassured me that if there is, in meantime, there is any other funding comes available, they'll let, they'll let me know. So I'm quite grateful for that. So we don't miss any opportunities So I'll continue my advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, MLA Sandu. Uh, I just want to remind our attendees that if they'd like to submit questions to the Q&A, they can do so uh, by typing it in there. If we can't manage to get to it uh, within the timeline available today, we can always submit those questions on your behalf at, a, at another time. Um, so just keeping the order of things, we'll go back to uh, Minister Callum. And uh, the question is, how is government supporting the retraining of individuals who have lost their job to COVID uh, and is there opportunity to promote jobs in the innovation and green energy sectors if those jobs aren't expected to go Yeah, I appreciate the question. And uh, not only is there uh, opportunity, um, but it's necessity for, for a government and our economic recovery to focus on those sectors. As I said, uh, our focus on our economic recovery is innovation, sustainability, and inclusiveness. And, uh, and training and retraining and upskilling is gonna be a critical component of, of, of that plan. You know, we just recently announced uh, $20 million. Uh, that was part of Stronger BC, our recovery package for training. Uh, we've got new programs that have been launched. UBC uh, just launched a program for climate adaptation and uh, for climate monitoring. Uh, there's a, um, uh, you know, there's been a whole host of programs that have been launched uh, to support uh, digital skills and online skills. Uh, $4 million were announced just last week, actually, for micro-credential programs, uh, which, uh, which I think is, is fantastic for, for, for whether it's young or old, but anyone to be able to get skills for a, sh a short period of time that they can find transferable for their workplace right away. Um, and, uh, and also for small businesses, we launched uh, the Launch Online program which uh, also supports innovation. I mean, it's critical for us now, if we look at this, the, the rate of change, the pace of change we've seen in the last year, it's critically important for us to support our small and medium-sized businesses in getting their websites up, to get their e-commerce set up so they can grow their market. Uh, and so we've got the launchonline.ca program. If, uh, if some of your members haven't heard of it, please check it out. I strongly encourage you to apply. Um, those dollars are up to $7,500 per business to uh, get up their get their online presence. You can even use it for some advertising uh, and you can use your local companies to help design your site and set up your e-commerce as well. And uh, I just think it's uh, where we need to go as a province to support our businesses in that transition. And I'll just touch on one final thing. Minister Pop, I'm talking about Buy BC, Grow BC, Feed BC. I think um, the Buy BC in particular is what we need for our small businesses. Uh, and so any opportunity I get, my colleagues get, we're reminding people to, to buy BC, support local, uh, so that the people we're training get opportunities to work in the communities that they live in. Thank you, Minister Callan. Next question for Minister Popham. Many North Okanagan, Okanagan farmers are wanting to retire, but land prices have made entry into the market challenging for younger, the younger generation. What can your ministry do to promote succession planning as a way of supporting local economies and food security? Thank you. That's a great question and it's really timely. Um, we do hear uh, often that uh, farmers are getting old, they don't want to farm anymore, and where is the next generation that's going to take over? Well, the good news is, is that the agriculture, food and fisheries sector is a huge economic driver in the province. We've seen about a 13% increase in revenues. So our just uh, uh, beverage sales, food and beverage sales are at $10.5 billion. Most people are quite surprised to hear that. And then uh, farm gate sales are at $3.9 billion. So there is money to be made and businesses to be run within agriculture, fish and food. And the land that we have uh, within the agricultural land reserve allows for farmers to uh, farm 
on a land base that we protected for years for our food security. And that's kind of coming into its own right now. When I travel around, when I used to travel around the province, but I hear from young, a young generation of farmer all the time, it's almost like a food renaissance. People want to be involved. And we do see uh, an older generation that either hasn't farmed their land for years or they're at the end of the time that they want to farm. We do have an excellent program called the BC Land Matching program and since uh, 2017 we've matched about a hundred farmers up bringing about 5,000 acres back into production right around the province the majority of those land matches have happened in the last year and a half and we see a really big momentum building. Uh, one of the most interesting things is there's bigger and bigger swaths of land that are coming into the land matching program. So we go out and we talk to people who own farmland, we put them in a database and then we have, uh, it's like speed dating for farmers. We match up new and uh, new farmers up with the, the land that's available. The one interesting thing is that we treat this as a business partnership and we have to look at what's fair in business. So looking at the length of leases so that farmers don't start up and then the landowner changes their mind a year later. So we, we help with the business supports on that end too. And uh, we're seeing some amazing success. So that's just one of the things that we're doing to enable uh, a transition of land. Thank you, Minister Popham. Next question for uh, MLA Sandu, and it is uh, non-food vendors are prohibited from farmers markets, which, which means markets may close because their revenue stream has been disrupted. Why does the government believe non-food vendors cannot operate safely under the same guidelines as food vendors or as retail stores? Thank you, Dan, for this question. And uh, I uh, appreciate the Vernon's farmer market provides good nutritious food and local food most importantly to our community and uh, this is a place where my family and I love to go on a regular basis. Non-food vendors are a great draw to the market which we know and uh, there has been a lot of discussion about Vernon farmers market and community and media and for now that is driving at least a bit, bit of traffic. I do understand the frustration and anxiety these vendors and the market feeling right now. Some people are demanding that market be reopened to non-food vendors. Since the beginning of this pandemic, all of the decision-making authority for the health restrictions was put into hands of public health officials and taken out of the hands of BC politicians. We're relying on uh, public health officials to put the health and well-being of everyone in the community priority. However, I personally uh, sent emails, uh, in fact, many emails to Dr. Bonnie Henry and Minister Dix's office uh, ever since. Since December, I've been uh, constantly addressing their concern. I've also had the opportunity, I believe a couple of weeks ago to first time ever directly speak to Dr. Henry during uh, one of the Zoom meetings. And she did mention that they're constantly looking into this and they're listening to different organizations and reassessing the situation. And the market will be reopened for non-food vendors when they deem it's safe to do so. Uh, meanwhile, our non-food vendors, as uh, Minister Kahlo mentioned, I would encourage them to uh, launch, you know, access the on, launch online grant as it's a great option for a grant to get an online store up and running with the government grant. Uh, please feel free to contact our office if you need further information regarding launch online grant and we'll be happy to assist you. And I will constantly be reminding uh, of, uh, you know, whenever I'll get the opportunity to Dr. Bonnie Henry, as, as she has reassured me that they're constantly looking into this concern and uh, they will allow, um, non-food vendors to be reopened once it's deemed to safe to do so. So, thank you. Thank you, Emily Sandu. Uh, next question over to uh, Minister Callum. So COVID has hit the tourism and accommodation sectors particularly hard. What more can be done to ensure these businesses can maintain cash flow and not close before economic recovery returns? Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, I was uh, doing an interview last week and, and somebody said to me, well, if 98.7% of the jobs have come back in the province, why are you spending millions to support uh, people and businesses? And, uh, and the truth is, 
that um, those numbers are deceiving in the sense that we know that uh, over 70% of uh, all businesses in BC are relying on some sort of government support to maintain their operation. And tourism industry in particular is facing a really challenging time uh, given that we don't have international travelers coming um, to the province, certainly not for a while. Uh, and so uh, Minister Mark, who's responsible for uh, tourism, arts and culture, uh, and I had a meeting with um, many of the associations that represent uh, tourism operators. Um, and there was a couple of things that we ju that jumped out. One was that we were always trying to find solutions and work with Dr. Henry's office to find solutions to keep as much open as safely possible. Uh, and many jurisdictions across the country, they look at BC with envy, uh, given how many lockdowns they've gone into. And, and so I give full credit to all the people that are following the rules and doing whatever it takes to keep their community safe, but also our businesses that are going well above and beyond uh, creating playbooks that have never been created before uh, so that we can keep people safe as well as, uh, as their employees and, uh, and community. Um, that being said, uh, you know, the discussion we had with the sector was, well, how much money do you need and how best to use it? They've come back with recommendations on how we can best support them. Some of that was uh, making the program for uh, small businesses uh, more accessible for more tourism operators. As I said, that program has seen about 60% uh, applications coming from just the tourism sector. Additional $5 million went to Indigenous-based tourism opportunities. Um, and, uh, and we know that there's going to be more supports needed uh, in the coming months, certainly at least till the end of the year. We're in conversation with the federal government as well, because what last thing we need to do is the federal government have programs that do something and we do something totally different. We want to make sure our programs are aligned, uh, that they understand the concerns that we're hearing from the tourism sector, that their programs and dollars that they're coming up with in their budget align with what we're doing. And so those conversations are going fairly well and uh, and there'll be more to come in the budget. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have supports available. We have the launch online program. We have the small medium sized business grants that are available. And then we have a uh, whole host of other measures that we've put in place. Uh, but we'll continue to work with the sector to find a, a path uh, as we go forward. But I think everyone's waiting for vaccines. Uh, as we start seeing more people vaccinated and we get to a place where we can start seeing some opening up, I think there's a real hunger to travel. Uh, I know everyone I know has got at least two trips planned uh, to go somewhere within BC and uh, and Vernon is such a beautiful place to be. I suspect uh, you're going to see a big uptake in people wanting to travel within BC and come to Vernon and enjoy all the things you have to offer. Certainly hope so, uh, but it's safe to do that. Uh, thank you, Minister Kellogg. Um, we do have a, a few questions that came in from our attendees. We are getting really close to time, so I'm going to try and sneak in a couple of those in. Leave it open to you, whoever wants to answer, and maybe we'll just snappy, snappy answers if possible. Uh, so maybe one that can be answered really quickly is, is Launch Online available for nonprofits? Uh, any any nonprofit or small business or medium-sized business that has at least $30,000 of revenue come in can apply. So there are a lot of nonprofits that have revenue coming in. Uh, and so if you can show up to $30,000 of revenue, whether that was in 2020 or 2019, and I suspect 2018 might be acceptable as well. Um, if you can show that revenue, you can apply. It doesn't matter if you're a not-for-profit or if you're a small, uh, small business or medium-sized business. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are rumors that the speculation tax is being expanded to vacant lots. Is this true? And is it going to be expanded uh, to other municipality, municipalities and towns as well? Well, um, Minister Spropman, I'll just jump in there. The rumor has reached Victoria. Uh, and and uh, so uh, that's the first I've heard of it. Um, and, uh, and so I would say it's just a, a rumor. And, um, and uh, if, if there's any changes that are coming in the future, there will be some dialogue and co consultation around it. Um, but right now, our focus isn't to increase any taxes. Our focus is to continue to support people and businesses during a pandemic. Uh, and certainly, I know that I saw one of the questions pop up in the group around uh, uh, how are we going to pay for it, which is uh, that trade is never late. Uh, right now, uh, you know, we can't afford to not spend uh, supporting businesses. Uh, we, you know, there has been a mindset and some people have asked me, uh, well, why are we spending any money? Because you know what, the tourism operators, they'll just fall. And when tourism picks up, they'll just, someone will pop up. Uh, that is certainly one mentality, uh, but it's not our mentality. Uh, we believe that it's better to put the supports in place now, keep these businesses uh, in their ability to operate so that when we see this real big pickup in, 
demand, which we will for sure, that the, uh, that the businesses are already there, they've, they've got their workforces and we can keep, uh, uh, keep our economy going. And so that's the mindset we're taking. Uh, and so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not, I can't really comment on the rumor. It's the first I've ever heard of it. Okay, thank you for uh, clarifying. Um, is it thought that registering all farm animals will aid in economic recovery? I think I'll take that question. Um, that's about our premise ID pro uh, program, I think. So premise ID is coming in to be a mandatory program, which is news to people. Uh, premise ID has been voluntary. And what, what it is, is it's a way of having traceability on uh, farm animals around the province. So people uh, register for free where their animals are in a geographic location. And why we, why we like that and why the rest of Canada is also moving in that direction is if there's a disease outbreak, we're able to respond as quickly as possible. But where we found the biggest value was during the 2017 forest fire season, we were able, anybody who had registered in premise ID was able to go in and out of a fire area with that traceability number. Uh, so they could go and take care of their animals during a really critical time. And so uh, we're moving towards um, it being mandatory for 2022, but we've had a lot of success. There's a lot of people that have already registered uh, uh, volunteering to do that and we encourage people to do so up until 2022. Thank you so much Minister Popham. Seeing that the time is uh, 1 44 we're, we're coming right to the end of time here uh, so maybe I'll give each of you a quick 30 seconds or less to uh, to wrap things up and give a, a bit of a closing statement and we'll start with Minister Kellan. Yeah I'll, I'll keep it short Dan. Thank you for the invite. Uh, thank you to the Chamber for all the work you do and a special thank you to all the small business, we all many of your members. Uh, it's been a phenomenally difficult year. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I took a moment over family day just to reflect on the craziness that's happened in the last year. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to take some time to process. But uh, we are uh, right now we've created what I call a super COVID committee, which is a 60 business association. The BC Chamber is rep well represented there, uh, where we talk about all the challenges that we're seeing in the province. Uh, Dr. Henry and her team come in and give us um, their perspective, and we're sharing advice and giving advice back and forth on how best to manage it. I think that's a model that's worked really well for us here in BC and certainly something that other jurisdictions are gonna replicate, but we're still gonna be in it for a little while. I appreciate everyone's patience and the same kind of teamwork approach that we've been using in BC for the last year is what we're gonna need when we get out of this uh, to make sure we have a strong economic recovery and that everybody can see uh, an opportunity to benefit in that. So, so thank you for the invite. Thank you to my colleague, Minister Popham, and of course, Harwinder, uh, he's amazing. So thank you for being with us. Thank you, Minister Kellogg. Uh, over to you, Minister Popham. Thank you, I'll make it brief as well. I've really appreciated being here and I'm really happy that it, my colleagues were able to join as well. Um, being able to pop into Vernon is a treat in our days. Um, we we are, are so grateful that we are able to continue as government and, and do the work that needs to do. We do see the light at the end of the tunnel, but as my good friend, Minister Callan says, the tunnel is very long at this point, but uh, the work we're doing um, we, we is relentless, although we, are very happy to be doing it. Um, as far as my ministry goes, we have about 65,000 people that work in agriculture, food and fisheries. And there are a lot of jobs available domestically here in British Columbia. We've got a website people can go to if they would like to take a, a try at the agricultural field. Uh, we've got some really incredible jobs. Not all of them are working in the fields. We've got a, a huge array of opportunities and those are coming up for this season. Um, but we have about 200 land-based commodities, 100 sea-based commodities. Agriculture, fish and food is a massive economic driver and we will continue to find a way to support businesses in this sector uh, the best that we can. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Minister Pablo. And MLA, uh, Harwinder Sandu. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Chamber, for giving us the opportunity to hear from our Chamber members and attendees. Thank you, Minister Kalum and Minister Popham for joining in today and for answering these great questions. 
I am fully committed to be there uh, for you as your MLA, and I encourage you all to please reach out to our office anytime to share any concerns, thoughts, ideas, and feedback so I can best represent you by providing my ongoing support. Once again, thank you so much for your resiliency, hard work, and sacrifices in order to help us deal with the COVID-19 and for keeping us safe. Uh, there is always a uh, light at the end of the tunnel, as my colleagues mentioned, even though it's long. So let's, I'll still uh, wait for that light. And I see that hopefully we're getting closer. And I'm hopeful that 2021 will be kinder and better year for us. So please keep up the good work, stay safe and stay healthy. I would say thank you. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the Greater Vernon Chamber of Commerce, we really appreciate your time and dedication to be with us today to the three of you panelists. And thank you to uh, our members. We are proud to serve you and, and offer these uh, types of events to, to represent you and be your voice and, and give the opportunity to have your voice heard and share your questions and concerns with uh, elected officials. Uh, so with that said, I will uh, bid everyone adieu and just remind you that if you did submit a question today on your behalf, we will uh, forward it on to a, the, uh, the respected elected official to, to hopefully answer and we'll send that back to you. Okay, uh, I hope everyone enjoys their Friday afternoon and uh, we'll see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>